one of the things that I notice about you or my observation of you is that you've had many transformations. I feel like you really have through different mm. phases of your life, everything from uh, how you grew up and not, you know, claiming to be an entrepreneur to um, being uh, having addiction to being an endurance athlete to having a successful podcast now books. And it's like, you are like top of the list for people that have had so many magnificent transformations and have so many stories. So it's definitely your turn to tell the story of of how you were able to do that. And what I mean, I guess I'm really curious about what what allows you to be able to move from one phase to another phase. And was it effort or is that something that actually comes natural? Not not everything's easy, but that is seemingly mm -hmm. from an observational standpoint very much part of your life yeah well i i appreciate that observation danica i mean i i, I don't i'm not sure exactly how to dive into this I, I would say that the changes and the transformations that i've endured in my life are generally uh catalyzed by some kind of pain point <laughs> you know where mm -hmm. where the pain of my current uh situation exceeded the fear of doing something different. And mm. that has typically been my motivator. And I've gone kicking and screaming into all of these transformations. None of it was graceful, linear, or, or overnight. It's, you know, when you kind of look at it in the rear view mirror, me now being an older person, it all kind of looks like it unfolded very naturally and gracefully. But, you know, the lived experience of that was very different. Uh, right. But, you know, as a result of, of having to change or being compelled to change because of pain has taught me a few things about the nature of change itself. And, you know, that began with my struggle with alcoholism and ultimately getting sober and, you know, learning tools for a different way of living, uh, which, you know, I think opened me up to the possibility, A, that, you know, I could change and if I could change, other people could change. And as a result of my participation in the recovery community being witness being witness to so many people changing their lives in miraculous ways and then understanding that you know change isn't a static thing like we have to continue to grow and iterate like there is no stasis there's no sitting on our laurels and you know yes i have you know weathered that experience and overcome it but what are the other areas of my life that remain hidden or that i don't want to look at that you know, require redress and ultimately some level of transformation. And I've kind of, you know, repeated that time and time again, like from addiction issues to transferring addiction issues onto workaholism and my relationship with food and my relationship with my physical self, like all of those have gone, undergone, you know, massive transformations over the years. But mm -hmm. this process still continues. Like yeah. now I'm a parent and I have, teens that have their own issues and you know there's many times where i feel at a complete loss as a parent as to how to you know help these younger people or parent them or guide them in the best way possible and that provides an opportunity for me to have people on the podcast tell me how to do this you're the expert etc so you know as they say in the parlance of recovery the road gets narrower and you know, the, the, the kind of more you grow, the less tolerant you are of other aspects of how you behave mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, ultimately you can't sleep at night until you look at them. And, uh, you know, so that's sort of been the approach to all of it. But it's not like I wake up in the morning and I'm like, what am I going to change today? I'm so excited. <laughs> like I hold on tightly to, you know, my <laughs> my, you know, errant behavior patterns of which there are still many. Because <laughs> it's easier. I mean, like human nature is to repeat patterns. I think that's like we're programmed mm -hmm. to repeat the patterns that are instilled into us. And so I think maybe the way to uh, get more focused and help people is explaining the process of a transformation, first of which is that you don't want it, right? Like, because the transformation is going to be hard. Like I would say, like, Lessons are not meant to be easy. You know, their they're, lessons are hard. And so maybe mm -hmm. first, what are the signs? Like, as you've been through so many different phases of this, have you been able to um, become more uh, 
aware and conscious of getting to a certain point where you're like, these things start happening when I know that I need to grow. Yeah, I mean, that's a huge subject matter. I mean, I guess I would begin by saying that, you know, we all do things that we know are not moving our lives forward. Like we know when we're spending too much time scrolling on our phone that we probably would be happier and more productive if we were doing something else and yet we keep doing it, right? That would be a a very relatable example of that. So the first step in making change is, 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 is simply awareness, like, okay, this is a problem. Um, and, you know, kind of snapping out of the denial that like, it's fine, you know, I can keep doing this and really getting honest with yourself to say, I know that I would be a happier, more productive person if I could shed this particular thing that is holding me back. So, you know, self-awareness, key, self-honesty, super important. Um, and then I think the first step of, of, of really approaching that change is asking for help and not trying to do it yourself, like mm-hmm. regardless of what the nature of the problem is. Like, cause I think once you mm. confide in another human being that you have a problem and that you would like help, suddenly no longer it's this private thing that's living inside of you, you have publicly announced it or semi-publicly announced it. Uh, And I think that's huge because now it's out there and there's sort of a release or a catharsis with just admitting it. Like that's why, you know, when you go into an AA AA meeting, you raise your hand and you say, you know, my name's Rich and I'm an alcoholic. Like you are making a public declaration of a problem that requires redress. So I think that's huge. Um, And then, you know, with the trusted people with whom you've confided this problem, I think the key, the absolute key beyond anything else in making a change is willingness, the willingness to do something different and the willingness to not only ask for help, but to accept help. So when that trusted confidant says, well, why don't you do this instead of retorting with all the reasons why that's a bad idea and you know how to solve it, just saying, okay, and then doing it and getting into action. Even if those actions are tiny, like, uh, maybe I'll reduce my phone consumption, you know, 20% or whatever. They don't have to be massive, gigantic gestures. Like I'm yeah. going to throw my phone in the ocean and never use a cell phone again. Like those tend to be, you know, uh, losing propositions over the long haul. And what you're really yeah. trying to do is establish um, a new behavioral pattern that will withstand the test of time and be sustainable. So. The sustainable change happens with tiny iterations that, you know, little behavioral tweaks that you master and become kind of rote in your experience over time. And Mm. the big changes that you seek really are a function of tiny little things that you do repeatedly, consistently over extended periods of time. That's how you move the needle on on anything, frankly. Yeah, I think... uh... I, I think that's what James Clear says in Atomic Habits. It's like you think that it's like all of a sudden one thing happens and then, oh, there it is. But it's actually been all of the little things that you've done over and over and over again so many times. And then all of a sudden things do change, but you, but it can look like it, it, it wasn't that, but it does take that commitment to it. So what's the mm-hmm. what's the shittiest part? Like, I think this is where for me, transformation and growth. And like, I feel like it's important for people to just know that there is a really, really shitty part. Like there's a, there's a, there's per, whether it's emotionally or in your immediate reality with people where you live, your job, whatever, like there can be, there, there usually is in my experience anyway, the bigger the transformation, usually it comes with a package that is like, wow, this is a lot right now. This is a very overwhelming amount of stuff. But I think that, that talking about the, what I would call it, like the alchemy or the, the, the burning down of something. So something else can be born and, and grow new from it is important for people to understand. Has that been your experience too well you, yeah you can't you can't be a phoenix unless you burn first right you got to right. burn in the flames That's in order this to is. kind of emerge with a greater wisdom right but i think the thing is danica <laughs> i mean frankly i think it all sucks 
It's terrible. <laughs> like there's nothing like sexy or romantic about like trying to make a change. It's a very difficult, uncomfortable, you know, inelegant thing. And I, you know, to the extent that the internet paints it as, you know, something that's that's easy or that can be accomplished, you know, without discomfort, I think is a disservice to people. I think it is important to tell people like, yeah, it fucking sucks. It's really hard. Like the reason it's hard is because whatever you're doing, whether it's gambling or you keep getting into the, you know, the same bad relationship or, you know, you drink too much or whatever, you know, the change is that you're trying to make, it's important to understand that that behavior exists for a reason. And the reason is it's serving a purpose. Like it's either taking you out of the, the, the discomfort of the moment or it's a reflection of you know a childhood trauma or it's a behavioral pattern that got cemented very early in life that makes you feel secure and in control whatever the nature of it uh the truth remains that you're doing it for a reason and that reason is because it is serving you it may be creating chaos in your life as well mm-hmm. but it is comforting you in a certain way And when you ask that person, look, you got to stop doing that, or the person decides, like, I can't do this anymore, you're asking them to break up with with a with a good friend, right? They're having to they have to like part ways with this thing that has been a comfort blanket for them for a very long time. And so the early days of of you know navigating letting go of that is almost a morning and it's super painful and it's really uncomfortable. And there will be many moments where you know, you're going to want to go back to it or Mm -hmm. the discomfort of having to really confront the challenging emotions that start coming up when you don't have that comfort blanket can be completely overwhelming. And it's why mastering a change or overcoming an addiction can be so difficult. And, you know, I use I don't use the word addiction cavalierly. Like I think addiction really lives on a spectrum. So on the far end of that spectrum, you have you know, the hardcore alcoholic or the heroin addict, et cetera. But, you know, I think that we all live somewhere along this spectrum because we're all engaging in behaviors that we know are not a reflection of our higher mm-hmm. self. And yet we can't seem to stop doing them. And, you know, and, and they're not making our lives better. They're making our lives worse. And that's the classic definition of, of addiction. Mm-hmm. 